did you, guys read my, did you did you read my annual letter any of you three assholes I uh, I saw your no, commentary. That's a no, <laughs> that's a no. I get it. I get it. I reviewed the table where you listed all your results, and I actually sent it to my team. I was like, "This is a really nice way of summarizing, you know, a firm's results over, you know, a long period of time." Because you had every fund and your totals and, uh, and, all, and all the key metrics. Well, can I talk about that for a second? Yes, please. You know what's in, what's incredible about what you're saying, Sachs, is I I was interested in a bunch of other funds that I'm invested in and their returns. And then I've also seen a bunch of leaked fundraising decks of all kinds of other firms from growth Mm. stage to crossover to PE. And it's incredible that they are not standardized, right? Mm. Some people only show gross IRR. Some people show net IRR. Some people don't show the total value of the paid in capital, which means, you know, if you have a hundred dollar fund, what is the total value of all of its holdings? Some people don't show DPI, which is distributions of paid in capital, which means, okay, for every dollar you've taken in, how many dollars have you sent up? If you don't show all of them, what was shocking to me is how much you can kind of hide and play and manipulate the numbers. And one of the most crazy things that I saw is that there are these late stage funds that write into their fundraising decks that what they actually use are lines of credit to juice IRR. So what they do is if they're about to do a deal, they'll actually get a loan from a bank, put that money into a company, wait until it's about to get marked up. And then what they do is they actually call that original money from their LPs what? and pay back their capital call line of credit. So what does it do? It inflates IRR. But this is why if you, do, if you see the other numbers, it still shows that it's kind of like, you know, not doing much of anything. So if you ever see multi-hundred percent IRRs or high, huge IRRs mm. with zero DPI, and a marginal TVPI, it's folks that are playing games to trick LPs. Just a heads up to That everybody. is so weird. So what you're saying is, just to summarize for people in the audience who don't understand, hey, we get judged on the rate of return each year. So if the stock market does 7 or 8%, we're expected to do triple that. So we got to hit 20, 25% each year. Now, the clock starts ticking when the money gets called from the LPs, the partners, Correct. and gets put into the company. So if you invest in your tour of your fund, You pull the money down from the LPs, you put it into YouTube, whatever it is. What you're saying is they will take a loan against that future money from a bank at an absurdly low interest rate, let's say 1% or 2%. Correct. They make the YouTube investment. Then two years later, YouTube has a price round that marks it up 20x. Then they put your cash in in year three of the fund, year two, and pay back the loan. Now they've paid 2% two years in a row, but the thing's gone up 20x. Correct. What a... That's that's dirty. Well, so it's it's dirty enough that the SEC has actually now introduced legislation. It was in February that basically is going to try to uncover all of this nonsense. And so you'll have to be much more transparent. So the format that I used, in my opinion, is the most transparent way of not being able to hide the cheese. You show all the critical elements together in a simple table that will make it very obvious who's playing games and who can actually make money. So th- there is a um, semi-legitimate version of the the loan thing, which is um, you know where this comes from is a capital call loan. So you know we're making a bunch of investments throughout the quarter, a million dollars here for a C deal, ten million for a Series A. You know that's happening all the time. You don't necessarily want to hit your LPs with capital calls for every single little small yes. investment. So what we do is you get a capital call line from SVB or something like that, and then you do one capital call, call per quarter. And right. so they will loan you the money for, you know, one, two, three months, but it's not for a year. But the, but the reality is if you have a reasonably well-developed infrastructure, you have a cash forecast of what deals you may or may not close with probabilities. And so you know what the weighted amount of capital you need to have on your balance sheet is. So I agree with you to have a small amount at the edges to pay for expenses, to pay for salaries while you clean up at the end of a quarter, completely reasonable. But right. if you're making, you know, five or 10% commitments into a company and you're using this as a way to basically create subterfuge and hide, I, I think that that should not be allowed. Yeah. Yeah. The number of capital calls is annoying for people. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I did share you that table with our team to because I did like the format quite a bit. I, I book I think we'll start using reading it. it this weekend. It's very hard for funds who are not performant to use that format. Now, yours, you're, you're, you are very highly performant, so you can use that format. But I don't think people that have not returned money or, or have fake paper markups can use that format because it is too simple. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, at the end of the day, what metric 
do we all look at when we are LPs in a fund? Well, this is what I put down. I put down the ones that I look at for everybody else that I'm an LP in, you know? So what multiple. one is that for you? I, I, I look- Multiple on cash investment? No, I, I, I need to look at the, the totality of it. I need to okay. understand what is your gross and your net IRRs. Those are important things to understand because it shows how efficiently you put the money to work. Of course. But then, but then ultimately, then the other two things that really matter is what is the total value you've created and then what percentage of that have you given back to me? Because that allows you to understand how much paper value this. So for example, if today, let's just say you had a fund that had a TVPI, total value of paid in capital of a 5X. A 5X on a fund is incredible. But if you've distributed none of that, well, guess what? If we're sitting here in May of 2023, or 2022 rather, the total value of your paid in capital is not really 5x. It may be only 3x and it may be actually 2.5x considering what the uh, markets have done to these companies, right? And so it allows me to really understand how performant funds are in not just being a part of the game, but actually generating realizations. And this is the hardest part, as I told you, Jason, like this past quarter, I think I passed 2x across my funds when I was mm. managing outside capital. And I think, my gosh, it took me 11 years- It's hard. To return 2X the money. And that means I've returned two and a half billion dollars. You know how hard that was? Yeah, I mean, you gotta time the exit. You have to have the ability it's, to exit. You, know, you can't even time the exit. You have, to, you have to be constantly managing and working your portfolio. Sometimes you're selling in secondary transactions. Sometimes yes. you're actually trading up in private markets where you help this company merge with another private company. Other times, you know, if I think about it, the number of IPOs I've had is relatively de minimis. So how do you make $2 billion where I've only had one IPO, which has mm. been Slack? Yeah. So th this is a really, really hard business. And it was just a reminder that, you know, in the last four or five years, managing capital has seemed relatively easy. But in these next few years, you're going to see who's really, really good. It's kind of that old Warren Buffett quote, you know, yeah. you really, you know, you, you can see who's naked when the tide goes out. I mean, said another way, the last five years, raising a fund has been really easy uh, and writing checks has been really easy. And now comes, you know, act three, which is returning a multiple on the money you easily collected. And boy, is that hard. And, I, you know, I, all of these um, new the LPs. Other, the other, the other write, thing that I learned. Let me just tell you this one thing. Oh, though. I, all these LPs send me, even if I'm not an LP and a potential, they send potential LPs their performance because they're so proud of it, like quarterly. I'm like, not even in this fund. And they have these crazy markups, crypto investments, this, whatever. But they've returned no capital, and so it's just to like, give you just to give you a sense of it. If you if you look at the most fantastic organization in the world, if it were an investment manager, which is Berkshire, their long run fifty year track record is you know around twenty percent, right? Gross. If you look at the most successful asset manager in the world, and I would put Blackstone at that, just incredibly good and best in class in probably three enormous parts of the worldwide economy: real estate credit um, and private equity, you know, their long run track record is that on 200 and some odd billion dollars of private equity and another hundred billion dollars of, of, um, of real estate, they've returned 2x. So that's what the upper bound is, you know, doubling people's money and generating 15 to 20% is the best you can expect if you are really excellent and long lived. That's the best. What do you look at, Freeberg, when you're an LP? What number do you care about? Because you LP other funds, and, and I think all of us do at times. I made my first venture fund investment in 2006. And I, I am still getting distributions from that fund. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, this is a 2.4x. Over that period of time, I'm like, what the hell? Why did I even put this money into this fund? I guess this makes sense for pension funds and, you know, very large balance sheet, long range investors that need to kind of diversify. But as an individual, I should have put my money and have had liquidity on it for 16 years rather than have it locked up in, in a bunch of private companies sloshing around and, you know, kind of dribble out. And at the end of all this, I only get two and a half times my money back. Two and a half times your money in 16 years. What's that IRR? It's like low teens. Yeah, not a great deal. No, right? no, it's lower. And, you would have been um, you would have been better owning the S and P five hundred. That's right. And so for me, I think the 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 key the, the metric the only metric that matters, which I think you're saying, Chamath, is how much cash I got out relative to cash I put in. And so initially, my my IRR is negative ninety seven percent. 
and then it goes up to negative 80 and then you negative 60 and negative 30 and negative 20. And now it's 14% because I finally got more money out than I put in. And so it doesn't feel to me like, uh, you know, the, the just generally private investing, everyone gets excited because we all get sold stories and individuals all get sold stories of you put a dollar in, you get a hundred bucks in. I mean, J. Cal wrote a book called How I Made a Hundred Million Bucks from whatever you invested um, in Uber. Yep. And, um, and that story, I think, gets everyone kind of excited. But the reality is, the vast majority of the time, and if you diversify your bets like this, you're going to end up waiting a long time to get your money back. You're going to be locked up. And a top performing fund is returning 2.5x after 15 years, which is no, not much better than kind of investing in the S&P, where you could sell that anytime you want and use that cash for any purpose you want. Well, if you did a $100,000 investment... Uh, and you return 260,000 in 15 years. I'm on an IRR calculator right now. Internal rate of return at 6.58%. Yeah. Uh, Better so off than the S&P. Uh, yeah. I mean, and if you did QQQQ, depending on, yeah, how hot the market was then. Yeah. And it's you get really, to sell. It's really, really, really hard to actually make money. There are always going to be periods where people look like geniuses and have markups. But you can really see when people have skill after a decade and a couple of up and down cycles. Same with hedge funds, by the way, right? <laughs> hedge funds put up a score every year. And in certain macro cycles that can last many, many years, everyone looks like they're doing well. And then all of a sudden, tides go out and you lose more than you made over that period of time. And then you realize, holy crap, I was actually in an insurance business where you get paid some small premium every year. And then you have some massive loss one year. And that massive loss, it turns out your underwriting wasn't good because you lose more than the um, sum of all of the premium you collected over that period of time. And unfortunately, a lot of investing looks like this, which is you have small returns for a long period of time, and then some massive loss. And, uh, and the whole business makes you look like, you know, along the way a genius. But the reality is over any, any long cycle, um, most folks end up kind of in a bad position um, and, and they end up, you know, the, the, the SEC, by the way, has, um, has solved this for mutual funds, right? And ETFs, you know, yes. there's, there's standard very reporting. strict, there's very strict standard reporting. And I do think that as, um, you know, for example, like if you go to the big banks, sorry, sex interrupt, I just want to finish the last thought. If you go to the big banks and you have, if you're an individual, like a doctor or a dentist or somebody, and then, and they will aggregate and pool capital and put it into these funds on your behalf, as an example. So, you know, it looks like JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs is a, you know, 50 or $100 million LP in one of these big funds. But in fact, it's just the sum of a bunch of folks on their platform. It stands to reason that if the SEC can actually mandate standardized reporting for private investing, it would actually be a really good thing because all of these games will and probably currently are, as far as I've seen in these presentations, tricking a lot of folks to put their hard-earned money into things that actually will never make money. And it's because if you selectively cherry-pick how you present this data, you, you, you can tell a partial truth. So, you know, I would really, I would love, I'm happy to be compared to, to any organization, but every time I hear somebody chirping about how good they are, my only comment is, I just want to see your table in the same format as my table, and we can compare it because it allows me to really understand. Yeah, liquid returns. And by the way, the point I made earlier about um, when markets are generally good, hedge fund public market investors generally can look like they're doing well by having a good marginal return above the, the, the benchmark every year, and then one year have a big drawdown. And suddenly they realize that their underwriting wasn't that good. The same can be true in, in private investing, in the opposite way, in the sense that you'll put in small checks, small checks, and lose money and lose money and lose money, and then have one big banger, and you get 100x return, and you look like a genius, because your whole portfolio looks good. But you fast forward and you keep doing that for another 10 years, all those small checks may not even add up to the banger. And that's, um, that's the flip reality that you realize. And by the way, I think that's a good analogy for the difference between public and private investing. You have similar cash flow economics where you can have small returns and then a big loss in public. And you can have small losses and then a big return in private. And the timing of when you present your data can make anyone look good if you catch a good hit at the right time or you don't have a bad hit at the wrong time. And then the framing over a long enough period of time, I think really becomes the key measure. And the, the reality is most people don't make it long enough in their career to actually, to actually present true results in, in, in how they really do underwrite. And by the way, to the extent anybody's listening is able to invest in these private funds, I think Jason mentioned this uh, superficially. So let me just dig into it because I think it's really, really thoughtful what he said, which you should understand. 
If you have the option to invest in a private fund, you have to understand that that private fund has two huge negative things working against it relative to investing in the S&P 500. So you could put your money into a Vanguard ETF, or if you could put your money into a private fund, you need to realize two things. Number one is it is illiquid, not just for 10 years, but it could be illiquid for 12 or 14 or in, you know, um, Friedberg's case, 16 years. So you need to get paid a premium for owning that. And then the second is, depending on the business model, you may have very high failure rates, which means that you need to really hit these outsized Grand Slam home runs. And if you don't, then you're going to be worse off than if you had invested in the S&P 500. So that deserves a premium. And so Jason's right, which is the S&P is between 7 and 8% over long periods of time, predictable compounding. That's, you have to add another 7 to 8% for this illiquidity premium and another 7 to 8% for the business model viability of, for example, being in venture. When you add those three things together, you do need to get paid basically in the low to mid-20s returns to be justified. Otherwise, you are much better off just owning the S&P 500. Much, much, much better off. Sax, uh, do you, what do you look for when you're LPing? And now that you have many large funds, what do you think LPs are looking for now? And what do you advise them to stay focused on? The, the number one metric that matters is DPI, which is the ratio of distributions to paid in capital. And it's basically money in versus money out, right? At the end of the day, that's all that matters is how much money did you put in the fund? How much money did you get out? The issue is that, to Jamal's point, these are 10 to 12-year funds, and it takes a long time to get distributions. So all the other metrics are basically triangulations or approximations of what you think the fund's going to do until you actually get to distributions. So I would say in the long term, it's all DPI. In the short term, you look at TVPI, the total value to paid in capital. So it's basically what's the marked up value of all the positions in the portfolio versus how much cash has gone in. And then the big question is, does the TVI, TVPI turn into DPI? DPI. Does yeah. the total so value to turn into DPI? To explain that to people, if Chamath had invested in Slack, but there hadn't been an outcome, it could be on the books for a billion dollar position. So the TVPI is looking really great. But until that company goes public and the shares are distributed, you, you know, the LPs haven't realized it. So it's, it could be ephemeral or it could go down significantly as we've seen with public markets. Yeah. So in the last four months, we just returned our fund one uh, in terms of like real distributions. I think we have like a DPI of like 1.1 or 1.2 on that fund now. Uh, the TVPI is like four to five. So, but it feels great just to distribute the entire fund out. To I, I literally, in my first two funds, I think we, we did that as well. And it, it's a really great feeling. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, selling 10% or 20% of a position early and getting over that hurdle and, and just getting into the, the one to two X, that's a pretty great feeling. By the way, just to talk about how difficult it is to convert paper gains into real gains. Let's just say, Jason, in your example, you had a fund that had these huge paper gains, but haven't distributed anything as coming into this year. Okay. Here's a little interesting data about the ultimate buyer of all of these tech stocks, which is the NASDAQ, right? People that buy stocks in the NASDAQ. Listen to this as of yesterday. More than 45% of stocks on the NASDAQ are now down 50%. So basically one in two. More than 22% of stocks on the NASDAQ are down 75%. So almost one in four and more than uh, one in five. And then more than 5% of stocks, so one in 20, on the NASDAQ are down 90%. So you can use this to actually get a blended average. But what it means is that the ultimate buyers of tech stocks are taking a 60% discount to what they were able to buy even just four months ago. 60%. So there is no public mark that will support a private mark unless it's also discounted by at least 60%. Now think about that when you talk about this entire panoply of companies that have been overfunded, many who are under executing and burning enormous amounts of money, who now have to come back out to the market, any sophisticated buyer will have to tell them the truth, which is, I'm sorry, guys, but the data says there's a 60% discount to this mark. Are you willing to accept it or not? Otherwise, the lights are going to go off. Yeah. 
And these marks only happen, uh, in, at least in the private markets and venture funds, when a transaction occurs. So if somebody raised a bunch of money, as we talked about in previous episodes, at a billion dollars, you know, uh, and they're now worth 500 million, well, it, that's only going to uh, work itself out uh, in fund documents and reports for a year or two later when the next transaction occurs. So the, 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 there is a lagging effect. One thing I just want to bring up before we go into um, maybe GDP or the Bill uh, Huang situation is what we talked about on this pod last year about what was going to happen in private markets. Uh, I've been seeing the last two or three weeks, and I, I don't know, Sachs and, and Freeberg, what you're seeing in private markets. But really acutely, people who are going out and skipping rounds, this like, I'm going to, you know, just skip my seed round and just do a series A. I don't have product market fit. I'm going to get credit for work that hasn't been done. I'm going to raise 10 million without product market fit. Oh my Lord, has this, uh, the, has the dialogue changed? I've been on many calls with founders who've met with 50 VCs and the conversations are moving to, you know, how many months to break even? And, uh, you know, how many customers do you have and how have they increased? And let's talk about the churn. It is getting, uh, super pragmatic out there. If you're a founder, and we, we said this a year ago, but it's worth stating here, this is not the moment I would try to over optimize. If you have a term sheet or money on the table, I would I would close it uh, just, you know, founder to founder. What are you seeing, Sachs? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's gotten a lot harder, I think, especially at the growth rounds. We actually have signed two growth term sheets recently. And it was much harder for us to do growth rounds last year, just because you had these huge mega funds come in at crazy valuations. But now they're kind of licking their wounds and we're starting to see some really attractive growth opportunities. Everyone else has backed off. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's changed quickly. Yeah. Now, one, one thing to, I, you know, Tarath raised a good point about, you know, private, not only are private valuations sort of sticky, but private marks are sticky. And, you know, companies only get remarked every couple of years. And so whereas the public markets get remarked every day. So it is hard to know, like, what is the proper valuation of a company that raised money last year? Because yes, valuation multiples have come way down, but then also they may have grown and their performance is better. So the analysis that I saw Jason Lemkin do in his LP newsletter, it, and we're basically repeating it for our entire portfolio, is to calculate what was the ARR multiple that you paid, basically valuation divided by ARR, what was that entry multiple and what is it today? And so we're doing that across our whole portfolio. So what you see is... Sorry, sorry, Sachs, clarification. Yeah. LTM ARR or, you know, uh, NTM ARR, which one? Basically, you Last look... Last 12 months, next 12 months? Yeah, no, you just look at their current ARR, which is, you know, run, run rate, rate, rate. Their current run, run rate, rate revenue. Okay, yeah. yeah, exactly. So take January, you times it by 12? Or in this case, it's April. April. Yeah, April yeah times basically, about yes. You take the current month and multiply by 12. But they have to be annual commitments, right? So if it's right. not, it has to be annually recurring revenue. If they're not, an, if it's not an annual commitment with an expectation that's recurring, you can't count it. So for example, you don't count professional services revenue in that, in any event. So the point is, you, you basically calculate what was the multiple that you paid at, you know, entry in the company and what is it today? as a function of the current valuation. And what we see is, yeah, there's a lot of companies that we got into, I don't know, two years ago at a valuation multiple that you couldn't defend today, 60 times, 80 times, 100 times. But the multiple today is more like 10 or 20 times because it's actually grown really fast. So you need to look at both sides of the equation. And that's the analysis we're running for every company in our portfolio. And then, you know, LPs can decide how to, how to market. I mean, the, the most important thing is what's the next investor, if they need more capital, going to market at? Well, the question is, are you growing faster than valuation multiples are falling? Correct. And then can you, th that means you could have a down round, a neutral round, or possibly an up round, but it doesn't. So are you starting to see people dis or people discussing on the board level or in your firm, hey, maybe we take a, a sideways round, a neutral round, we just go to last year's price and top off another 10 million? Are you seeing that? I've so told some of the boards I'm on, just keep fundraising, just keep the round open, top off if there's money available, because, you know, especially if you raised your round eight months ago, six months ago, those prices, like if people are still willing to invest in those terms, that's a good deal. I literally had this conversation with the founder this week where they had raised that in a great valuation and they turned money away because they were like, yeah, well, that we're was gonna, a mistake. 
That was we're, we're still growing. So yeah. why would we take the money now if our valuation is going to be, you know, double in nine months? And now it looks like, yeah, maybe, you know, that extra one to $5 million would have been good to lock up. OK, 